everyone and welcome back to another video. Today we are going to be reading part four of seven of Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. Um, just a quick reminder that you can always listen to um, the channel's videos on the Tingles app um, ad-free. You can create playlists, you can um, lock your screen and just listen. So there is a link in the description box below that uh, will help you download the app and find the channel if you're not already following and listening on there. Um, as always, thank you for your support. Um, I greatly appreciate it, and I greatly appreciate the feedback I've gotten on this series, and I'm excited to continue with you guys. Um, just a quick side note, I do apologize in advance if there is any background noise of rain and or thunder. It's pretty stormy here this week in Phoenix, so... There's not much I can do about that, unfortunately, but hopefully it'll be a bit calming and not too loud. Without further ado, here's part four. Niagara Falls is very nice. It's like a large version of the old Bond sign on Times Square. I'm very glad I saw it, because from now on, if I'm asked whether I've seen Niagara Falls, I can say yes, and I'll be telling the truth for once. When I told my advisor I was going to Erie, Pennsylvania, I had no idea of going there, but as it turned out, I was. My intention was to creep across the neck of Ontario, bypassing not only Erie, but Cleveland and Toledo. I find out of long experience that I admire all nations and hate all governments, and nowhere is my natural anarchism more aroused than at national borders where patient and efficient public servants carry out their duties in matters of immigration and customs. I have never smuggled anything in my life. Why then do I feel an uneasy sense of guilt on approaching the customs barrier? I crossed a high toll bridge and negotiated a no man's land and came to the place where the Stars and Stripes stood shoulder to shoulder with the Union Jack. The Canadians were very kind. They asked where I was going and for how long, gave Rosinante a cursory inspection, and came at last to Charlie. Do you have a certificate of rabies vaccination on the dog? No, I haven't. You see, he's an old dog. He was vaccinated long ago. Another official came out. We advise you to not cross the border with him then. But I'm just crossing a small part of Canada and re-entering the U.S. We understand, they said kindly. You can take him into Canada, but the U.S. won't let him back. But technically, I am still in the U.S. and there's no complaint. There will be if he crosses the line and tries to get back. Well, where can I get him vaccinated? They didn't know. I would have to retrace my way at least 20 miles, find a vet, have Charlie vaccinated, and then return. I was crossing only to save a little time, and this would wipe out the time saved and much more. Please understand, it is your own government, not ours. We are simply advising you, it's the rule. I guess this is why I hate governments, all governments. It is always the rule, the fine print carried out by fine print men. There is nothing to fight, no wall to hammer with frustrated fists. I highly approve of vaccination, feel it should be compulsory, rabies is a dreadful thing. And yet I found myself hating the rule and all governments that made rules. It was not the shots, but the certificate that was important, and it was usually so with governments. Not a fact, but a small slip of paper. These were such nice men, friendly and helpful. It was a slow time at the border. They gave me a cup of tea and Charlie half a dozen cookies, and they seemed genuinely sorry that I had to go to Erie, Pennsylvania for the lack of a paper. And so I turned about and proceeded toward the Stars and Stripes and another government. Exiting, I had not been required to stop, but now the barrier was down. Are you an American citizen? Yes, sir. Here's my passport. Do you have anything to declare? I haven't been away. Have you a rabies vaccination certificate for your dog? He hasn't been away either. But you are coming from Canada. I have not been in Canada. I saw the steel come into eyes, the brows lower to a level of suspicion, 
Far from saving time, it looked as though I might lose much more than even Erie, Pennsylvania. Will you step into the office? This request had the effect on me a Gestapo knock on the door might have. It raises panic, anger, and guilty feelings whether or not I have done wrong. My voice took on the strident tone of virtuous outrage, which automatically arouses suspicion. Please step into the office. I tell you, I have not been in Canada. If you were watching, you would have seen that I turned back. Step this way, please, sir. Then into the telephone. New York license, so-and-so. Yes, pick up truck with camper top. Yes, a dog. And to me, what kind of dog is it? Poodle. Poodle, I said. Poodle, light brown. Blue, I said. Light brown. Okay, thanks. I do hope I did not sense a certain sadness in my innocence. They said you didn't cross the line. That's what I told you. May I see your passport? Why? I have not left the country. I'm not about to leave the country. But I handed over my passport just the same. He leafed through it, pausing at the entry and exit stamps of other journeys. He inspected my photograph, opened the yellow smallpox vaccination certificate stapled to the back cover. At the bottom of the last page, he saw penciled in a faint set of letters and figures. What is this? I don't know. Let me see. Oh, that. Well, that's a telephone number. What's it doing in your passport? I guess I didn't have a slip of paper. I don't even remember whose number it is. By now, he had had me on the run and he knew it. Don't you know it's against the law to deface a passport? I'll erase it. You should not write anything in your passport. That's the regulation. I won't ever do it again, I promise. And I wanted to promise him I wouldn't lie or steal or associate with persons of loose morals or convert my neighbor's wife or anything. He closed my passport firmly and handed it back to me. I'm sure he felt better having found that telephone number. Suppose after all his trouble... He hadn't found me guilty of anything, and on a slow day. Thank you, sir, I said. May I proceed now? He waved his hand kindly. Go ahead, he said. And that's why I went toward Erie, Pennsylvania, and it was Charlie's fault. I crossed the high iron bridge and stopped to pay toll. The man leaned out the window. Go on, he said. It's on the house. How do you mean? I seen you go through the other way a little while ago. I seen the dog. I knew you'd be back. Why didn't you tell me? Nobody believes it. Go ahead. You get a free ride one way. He wasn't government, you see. But government can make you feel so small and mean that it takes some doing to build back a sense of self-importance. Charlie and I stayed at the grandest auto court we could find that night, a place only the rich could afford, a pleasure dome of ivory and apes and peacocks and moreover with a restaurant and room service. I ordered ice and soda and made a scotch and soda and then another, Then I had a waiter in and bespoke soup and a steak and a pound of raw hamburger for Charlie, and I over-tipped mercilessly. Before I went to sleep, I went over all the things I wish I had said to the immigration man. Some of them were incredibly clever and cutting. From the beginning of my journey, I had avoided the great high-speed slashes of concrete and tar called thoroughways, or superhighways. Various states have different names for them, but I had dwaddled in New England, the winter grew apace, and I had visions of being snowbound in North Dakota. I sought out US-90, a wide gash of a superhighway, multiple lane carrier of the nation's goods. Rosinante bucketed along. The minimum speed on this road was greater than any I had previously driven. I drove into a wind quartering in from my starboard bow and felt buff- the buffeting sometimes staggering blows of the gale I helped to make. I could hear the so of it on the square surfaces of my camper top. Instructions screamed at me from the road once. Do not stop. No stopping. Maintain speed. Trucks as long as freighters went roaring by, delivering a wind like the blow of a fist. These great roads are wonderful for moving goods, but not for inspection of a countryside. You are bound to the wheel and your eyes to the car ahead, and to the rear view mirror for the car behind, and the side mirror for the car or trucks about to pass. And at the same time, you must read all the signs for fear you may miss some instructions or orders. No roadside stands selling squash juice, no antique stores, no farm products or factory outlets. When we get these thoroughways across the whole country, as we will and must, it will be possible to drive from New York to California without seeing a single thing. 
At intervals, there are places of rest and recreation, food, fuel, and oil, postcards, steam table food, picnic tables, garbage cans, all fresh and newly painted, restrooms and lavatories so spotless, so incensed with deodorants and detergents that it takes a time to get your sense of smell back. For deodorants are not quite correctly named. They substitute one smell for another, and the substitute must be much stronger and much more penetrating than the odor it conquers. I had neglected my own country too long. Civilization had made great strides in my absence. I remember when a coin in a slot would get you a stick of gum or a candy bar. But in these dining places, where vending machines or various coins could deliver handkerchiefs, comb and nail file sets, hair conditioners and cosmetics, first aid kits, minor drugs such as aspirin, mild physics, pills to keep you awake. I found myself entranced with these gadgets. Supposedly you want a soft drink, you pick your kind, sun grape or coolie cola. Press a button, insert the coin, and stand back. A paper cup drops into place, the drink pours out and stops a quarter of an inch from the brim. A cold, refreshing drink guaranteed synthetic. Coffee is even more interesting, for when the hot black fluid has ceased, a squirt of milk comes down and an envelope of sugar drops beside the cup. But of all, the hot soup machine is the triumph. Among ten, pea, chicken noodle, beef, and veg, insert the coin. A rumbling hum comes from the giant and a sign lights up that reads heating. After a minute, a red light flashes on and off until you open the little door and remove the paper cup of boiling hot soup. It is life at a peak of some kind of civilization. The restaurant accommodations, great scallops of counters with simulated leather stools are as spotless as and not unlike the lavatories. Everything that can be captured and held down is sealed in clear plastic. The food is oven fresh, spotless and tasteless, untouched by human hands. I remember with an ache certain dishes in France and Italy touched by innumerable human hands. The centers for rest, food, and replenishment are kept beautifully with lawns and flowers. At the front, nearest the highway, are parking places for passenger automobiles, together with regimens of gasoline pumps. At the rear, the trucks draw up, and there they have their services, the huge overland caravans. Being technically a truck, Rosinante took her place in the rear, and I soon made acquaintance with the truckers. They are a breed set apart from the life around them, the long-distance truckers. In some town or city somewhere, their wives and children live, while the husbands traverse the nation, carrying every kind of food and product and machine. They are clannish, and they stick together, speaking a specialized language. And although I was a small craft among monsters of transportation, they were kind to me and helpful. I learned that in the truck parks, there are showers and soap, and towels that I could park and sleep the night if I wished. The men had little commerce with local people, but being avid radio listeners, they could report news and politics from all parts of the nation. The food and fuel centers on the parkways or thoroughways are leased by the various states, but on other highways, private enterprise has truckers stations that offer discounts on fuel, bed, baths, and places to sit and shoot the breeze. But being a specialized group, leading special lives, associating only with their own kind, they would have made it possible for me to cross the country without talking to a local town-bound man. For the truckers cruise over the surface of the nation without being a part of it. Of course, in the towns where their families live, they have whatever routes possible. Clubs, dances, love affairs, and murders. I liked the truckers very much, as I always liked specialists. By listening to them talk, I accumulated a vocabulary of the road, of tires and springs, of overweight, the truckers over long distances have stations along the routes where they know the service men and the waitresses behind the counters, and where occasionally they meet their opposite number in other trucks. The great get-together symbol is the cup of coffee. I found I often stopped for coffee, not because I wanted it, but for a rest and a change from the unrolling highway. It takes strength and control and attention to drive a truck long distances, no matter how much the effort is made easier by air brakes and power-assisted steering. It would be interesting to know, and easy to establish with modern testing methods, how much energy in foot pounds is expected in driving a truck for six hours. Once Ed Ricketts and I, collecting marine animals, 
turning over rocks in an area, tried to estimate how much weight we lifted in an average collecting day. The stones we turned over were not large, weighing from 3 to 50 pounds. We estimated that on a rich day, when we had little sense of energy expended, each of us had lifted 4 to 10 tons of rocks. Consider then the small, unnoticed turning of the steering wheel, perhaps the exertion of only one pound for each motion, the varying pressure of foot on an accelerator, not more than half a pound perhaps, but an enormous total over a period of six hours. Then there are the muscles of shoulders and neck, constantly, if not unconsciously, flucked for emergency. The eyes darting from road to rearview mirror, the thousands of decisions so deep that the conscious mind is not aware of them. The output of energy, nervous and muscular, is enormous. Thus, the coffee break is a rest in many senses. Quite often I sat with these men and listened to their talk, and now and then asked questions. I soon learned not to expect knowledge of the country they passed through. Except for the truck stops, they had no contact with it. It was driven home to me like how sailors they were. I remember when I first went to sea, being astonished that the men who sailed over the world and touched the ports to the strange and exotic had little contact with that world. Some of the truckers on long hauls traveled in pairs and took their turns. The one off duty slept or read paperbacks. But on the roads, their interests were engines and weather and maintaining the speed that makes a predictable schedule possible. Some of them were on regular runs back and forth, while others moved over single operations. It's a whole pattern of life, little known to the settled people along the routes of the great trucks. I learned only enough about these men to be sure I would like to know much more. If one has driven a car over many years as I have, nearly all reactions have become automatic. One does not think about what to do. Nearly all the driving technique is deeply buried in a machine like unconscious. This being so, a large area of the conscious mind is left free for thinking. And what do people think of when they drive? On short trips, perhaps a arrival at a destination or memory of events at the place of departure. But there is left, particularly on very long trips, a large area for daydreaming or even, God help us, for thought. No one can know what another does in that area. I myself have planned houses I will never build, have made gardens I will never plant, have designed a method for pumping the soft silt and decayed shells from the bottom of my bay up to my point of land at Sag Harbor, of leaching out the salt, thus making a rich and productive soil. I don't know whether or not I will do this, but driving along I have planned it in detail, even to the kind of pump, the leaching bins, the test to determine the disappearance of the salinity. Driving, I have created turtle traps in my mind, have written long, detailed letters never to be put to paper, much less sent. When the radio was on, music has stimulated memory of times and places, complete with characters and strange sets, memory so exact that every word of dialogue is recreated. And I have projected future scenes, just as complete and convincing scenes, that will never take place. I've written short stories in my mind, chuckling at my own humor, saddened or stimulated by structure or content. I can only suspect that the lonely man peoples his driving dreams with friends, and the loveless man surrounds himself with lovely, loving women, and that children climb through the dreaming of their childless driver. And how about the areas of regrets? If only I had done so-and-so, or had not said such-and-such, such. my god, the damn thing might not have happened. Finding this potential in my own mind, I can suspect it in others, but I will never know, for no one ever tells. And this is why, on my journey, which was designed for observation, I stayed as much as possible on secondary roads where there was much to see and hear and smell, and avoided the great wide traffic sashes which promote the self-fostering daydreams. I drove this wide, eventless way called US-90, which bypassed Buffalo and Erie to Madison, Ohio and then found the equally wide and fast US-20 past Cleveland and Toledo, and so into Michigan. On these roads out of the manufacturing centers, there moved many mobile homes, pulled by specially designed trucks, and since these mobile homes comprise of one of my generalities, I may as well get to them now. Early in my travels, I had become aware of these things under the sun, 
of their great numbers, and since they occur in increasing numbers all over the nation, observation of them, and perhaps some speculation, is in order. They are not trailers to be pulled by one's own car, but shining cars as long as Pullman's. From the beginning of my travels, I had noticed the sale lots where they were sold and traded, but I began to be aware of the parks where they sit down in uneasy permanence. In Maine, I took to stopping the night in these parks, talking to the managers and to the dwellers in this new kind of housing, for they gather in groups of like to like. They are wonderfully built homes, aluminum skins, double walled with insulation, and often paneled with veneer of hardwood. Sometimes as much as 40 feet long, they have two to five rooms and are complete with air conditioners, toilets, baths, and invariably television. The parks where they sit are sometimes landscaped and equipped with every facility. I talked with the park men who were enthusiastic. A mobile home is drawn to the trailer park and installed on a ramp. A heavy rubber sewer pipe is bolted underneath. Water and electric power connected, the television antenna raised, and the family in, is in residence. Several park managers agreed that the last year, one in four new housing units in the whole country was a mobile home. The parkmen charge a small ground rent plus fees for water and electricity. Telephones are connected in nearly all of them simply by plugging in a jack. Sometimes the park has a general store for supplies, but if not the supermarkets, which dot the countryside, are available. Parking difficulties in the towns have caused these markets to move to the open country where they are immune from town taxes. This is also true of the trailer parks. The fact that these homes can be moved does not mean that they do move. Sometimes their owners stay for years in one place, plant gardens, build little walls of cinder blocks, put out awnings and garden furniture. It's a whole way of life that was new to me. These homes are never cheap and often quite expensive and lavish. I have seen some that cost $20,000 and contain all the thousands of appliances we live by. Dishwashers, automatic clothes washers and dryers, refrigerators, and deep freezes. The owners were not only willing, but glad and proud to show their homes to me. The rooms, while small, were well proportioned. Every conceivable unit was built in. Wide windows, some even called picture windows, destroyed any sense of being closed in. The bedrooms and beds were spacious, and the storage space unbelievable. It seemed to me a revolution in living and on a rapid increase. Why did a family choose to live in such a home? Well, it was comfortable, compact, easy to clean, easy to heat. In Maine, I'm tired of living in a cold barn with the wind whistling through, tired of the torment of little taxes and payments for this and that. It's warm and cozy and in the summer, the air conditioner keeps us cool. What is the usual income bracket for the mobiles? Well, that is variable, but a goodly number are in the $10,000 to $20,000 class. Has job uncertainty anything to do with the rapid increase of these units? Well, perhaps there are many. Well, perhaps there may be some of that. Who knows what is in store tomorrow? Mechanics, plant engineers, architects, accountants, and even here there, a doctor or a dentist live in the mobile. If a plant or factory closes down, you're not trapped with property you can't sell. Suppose the husband has a job and is buying a house and there's a layoff. The value goes out of his house. But if he has a mobile home, he rents a trucking service and moves on, he hasn't lost anything. He may never have to do it, but the fact that he can is a comfort to him. How are they purchased? On time, just like an automobile. It's like paying rent. And then I discovered the greatest selling appeal of all. One that calls through nearly all American life. Improvements are made on these mobile homes every year. If you are doing well, you turn yours in on a new model, just as you would with an automobile if you can possibly afford to. There's status to that, and the turn-in value is higher than that of automobiles because there's a ready market for used homes. And after a few years, the one expensive home may have a poorer family, and they are easy to maintain, no need to paint since they are usually full of aluminum, and are not tied to fluctuating land values. How about schools? The school bus picks up the children right at the park and brings them back. The family car takes the head of the house to work and the family to a drive-in movie at night. It's a healthy life out in the country air, 
The payments, even if high and festooned with interest, are no worse than renting an apartment and finding the owner for heat. And where could you rent such a comfortable ground floor apartment with a place for your car outside the door? Where else could the kids have a dog? Nearly every mobile home has a dog, as Charlie discovered to his delight. Twice I was invited to dinner in a mobile home and several times watched a football game on television. A manager told me that one of the first considerations in his business was to find and buy a place where television reception is good. Since I did not require any facilities, sewer, water, or electricity, the price to me for stopping for the night was $1. The first impression forced on me was that the permanence is neither achieved nor desired by mobile people. They do not buy for the generations, but only until a new model they can afford comes out. The mobile units are by no means limited to the park communities. Hundreds of them will be found sitting beside a farmhouse. And this was explained to me. There was a time when, on the occasion of a son's marriage and the addition of a wife and later of children on the farm, it was customary to add a wing, or at least a lean-to, on the home place. Now in many cases, a mobile unit takes the place of an additional building. A farmer from whom I bought eggs and home-smoked bacon told me of the advantages. Each family has a privacy it never had before. The old folks are not irritated by crying babies. The mother-in-law problem is abated because the new daughter has a privacy she never had and a place of her own in which to build the structure of a family. When they move away, nearly all Americans move away or want to. They do not leave unused and therefore useless rooms. Relations between the generations are greatly improved. The son is a guest when he visits the parent's house and the parents are guests in the son's house. Then there are the loners, and I have talked with them also. Driving along, you see a hill. Driving along, you see high on a hill a single mobile home placed to command a great view. Others nestle under trees, fringing a river or a lake. These loners have rented a tiny piece of land from the owner. They need only enough for the unit and the right of passage to get to it. Sometimes the loner digs a well in a cesspool and plants a small garden but others transport their water in a 50-gallon oil drum. Enormous ingenuity is apparent with some of the loaners in placing the water supply higher than the unit and connecting it with plastic pipe so that gravity flow is ensured. One of the dinners I had I shared in a mobile home was cooked in an immaculate kitchen, walled in plastic tile with stainless steel sinks and ovens and stoves flush with the wall. The fuel is butane or some other bottled gas which can be picked up anywhere. We ate in a dining alcove paneled in mahogany veneer. I've never had a better or a more comfortable dinner. I had brought a bottle of whiskey as my contribution and afterward we sat in deep comfortable chairs cushioned in foam rubber. This family liked the way they lived and wouldn't think of going back to the old way. The husband worked as a garage mechanic about four miles away and made good pay. Two children walked to the highway every morning and were picked up by a yellow school bus. Sipping a highball after dinner, hearing the rushing of water and the electric dishwasher in the kitchen, I brought up a question that had puzzled me. These were good, thoughtful, intelligent people. I said, one of our most treasured feelings is concerned roots, growing up rooted in some soil or some community. How did they feel about raising their children without roots? Was it good or bad? Would they miss it or not? The father, a good-looking, fair-skinned man with dark eyes, answered me. How many people today have what you were talking about? Ro what roots are there in an apartment 12 floors up? What roots are in housing development of hundreds and thousands of small dwellings almost exactly alike? My father came from Italy, he said. He grew up in Tuscany in a house where his family had lived maybe a thousand years. That's roots for you. No running water no toilet, and they cooked with charcoal or vine clippings. They had just two rooms, a kitchen and a bedroom where everyone slept, grandpa, father, and all the kids. No place to read, no place to be alone, and never had had. What was better? I bet if you gave my old man the choice, he'd cut his roots and live like this. He waved his hand at the comfortable room. Fact is, he cut his roots away and came to America. Then he lived in a tenement in New York, just one room, walk up, cold water, no heat. That's where I was born and I lived in the streets as a kid until my old man got a job upstate in New York in the grape country. You see, he knew about vines, 
That's about all he knew. Now you take my wife. She is Irish descent. Her people had roots too. In a peat bog, the wife said, and lived on potatoes. She gazed fondly through the door at her fine kitchen. Don't you miss some kind of permanence? Who's got permanence? Factory closes down, you move on. Good times and things opening up. You move on where it's better. You got roots, you sit and starve. You take the pioneers in the history books. They were movers. Take up land, sell it, move on. I read in a book how Lincoln's family came to Illinois on a raft. They had some barrels of whiskey for a bank account. How many kids in America stay in a place where they were born if they can get out? You've thought about it a lot. Don't have to think about it. There it is. I've got a good trade. Long as there's automobiles, I can get to work. Well, suppose the place I worked was Brooke. I got to move where there's a job. I get to my job in three minutes. You want I should drive 20 miles because I got roots? Later, they showed me magazines designed exclusively for mobile dwellers, stories and poems, and hints for successful mobile living. How to stop a leak, how to choose a place for sun or coolness, and there were advertisements for gadgets, fascinating things for cooking, cleaning, washing clothes, furniture, beds, and cribs. Also, there were full-page pictures of new models, each one grander and more shiny than the next. There's thousands of them, said the father, and there's going to be millions. Joe's quite a dreamer, the wife said. He's always figuring something out. Tell him your ideas, Joe. Maybe he wouldn't be interested. Sure I would. Well, it's not a dream, like she said. It's for real, and I'm going to do it pretty soon now. Take a little capital, but it would pay off. I've been looking around the used lots for the unit I want at the price I want to pay. I'm going to rip out the guts and set it up for a repair shop. I got enough tools nearly already, and I'll stock little things like windshield wipers and fan belts and cylinder rings and inner tubes, stuff like that. You take these courts are getting bigger and bigger. Some of the mobile people got two cars. I'll rent me a hundred feet of ground right near, and I'll be in business. There is one thing you can say about cars. There's nearly always something wrong with them and that they got to be fixed. And I'll have my house, this here one right beside my shop. That way I would have a bell and give 24 hour service. Sounds like a good deal, I said, and it does. The best thing about it, Joe went on, if business fell off, why, I just move on where it was good, his wife said. Joe's got it all worked out on paper where everything's going to go, every wrench and drill, and even an electric welder. Joe's a wonderful welder. I said, I take back what I said, Joe. I guess you've got your roots in a grease pit. You could do worse. I even worked that one out. And you know, when the kids grow up, we could even work our way south in the winter and north in the summer. Joe does good work, his wife said. He's got his own city customers where he works. Some men come 50 miles to get Joe to work on their cars because he does good work. I'm a real good mechanic, said Joe. Driving the big highway near Toledo, I had a conversation with Charlie on the subject of roots. He listened, but he didn't reply. In the pattern thinking about roots, I and most other people have left two things out of consideration. Could it be that Americans are restless people, a mobile people, never satisfied with where they are as a matter of selection. The pioneers, the immigrants who peopled the continent, were the restless ones in Europe. The steady-rooted ones stay home and are still there. But every one of us, except those forced here as slaves, are descended from the restless ones, the wayward ones who were not content to stay at home. Wouldn't it be unusual if we had not inherited this tendency? And the fact is that we have. But that's not the short view. What are roots, and how long have we had them? If our species had existed for a couple million years, what is its history? Our remote ancestors followed the game, moved with the food supply, and fled from evil weather, from ice, and the changing seasons. Then, after millennia beyond thinking, they domesticated some animals so that they lived with their food supply. Then, of necessity, they followed the grass that fed their flocks in endless wanderings. Only when agriculture came into practice, and that's not very long ago in terms of the whole history, did a place achieve meaning and value and permanence. But land is a tangible, and tangibles have a way of getting into a few hands. 
Thus, it was that one man wanted ownership of the land, and at the same time wanted servitude because someone had to work it. Roots were an ownership of land, intangible and immovable possessions. In this view, we are a restless species with a very short history of roots, and those not widely distributed. Perhaps we have overrated roots as a psychic need. Maybe the greater the urge, the deeper and more ancient is the need, the will, the hunger to be somewhere else. Charlie had no answer to my premise. He also was a mess. I had promised myself to keep him combed and clipped and beautiful, and I hadn't done it. His fur was bald and dirty. Poodles do not shed any more than sheep do. At night, when I had planned this virtuous grooming, I was always too busy with something else. I also noticed that a dangerous allergy I didn't know he had. One night, I had pulled up at a trucker's park where huge cattle trucks pulled up and cleaned their beds. Around the park, there was a mountain of manure and a fog of flies. Although Rosinante was screened, the flies got in in their millions and hid in the corners and would not be dislodged. For the first time, I got out the bug bomb and sprayed heavily, and Charlie broke into a sneezing attack so violent and prolonged, I finally had to carry him out in my arms. In the morning, the cab was full of sleepy flies, and I sprayed it, and Charlie had another attack. After that, whenever flying visitors invaded, I had to close Charlie out and air out the house or cab after the pests were dead. I never saw such a severe allergy. Since I hadn't seen the Middle West for a long time, many impressions crowded in on me as I drove through Ohio and Michigan and Illinois. The first was the enormous increase in population. Villages had become towns, and towns had grown into cities. The roads squirmed with traffic. The cities were so dense with people that all attention had to be devoted to not hitting anyone or not being hit. The next impression was of an electric energy, a force, almost a fluid energy, so powerful as to be stunning in its impact. No matter what the direction, whether for good or bad, the vitality was everywhere. I don't think for a second that the people I had seen and talked to in New England were either unfriendly or discourteous, but they spoke terrorously and usually waited for the newcomer to open communication. Almost on crossing the Ohio line, it seemed to me that people were more open and more outgoing. The waitress in a roadside stand said good morning before I had the chance to, discussed breakfast as though she liked the idea, spoke with enthusiasm about the weather, sometimes even offered some information about herself without my delving. Strangers talked freely to one another without caution. I had forgotten how rich and beautiful the countryside is. The deep topsoil, the wealth of great trees, the lake country of Michigan, handsome as a well-made woman, and dressed and jeweled. It seemed to me that the earth was generous and outgoing here in the heartland, and perhaps the people took a cue from it. One of my purposes was to listen, to hear speech, accent, speech rhythms, overtones, and emphasis, for speech is so much more than words and sentences. I did listen everywhere. It seemed to me that regional speech is in the process of disappearing, not gone, but going. 40 years of radio and 20 years of television must have had this impact. Communications must destroy localness by a slow, inevitable pro process. I can remember a time when I could almost pinpoint a man's place of origin by his speech. That is growing more difficult now and will in some foreseeable future become impossible. It is a rare house or building that is not rigged with spiky palmers of the air. Radio and television speech becomes standardized, perhaps better English than we had ever used. Just as our bread, mixed and baked, packaged and sold without benefit of accident or human frailty, is uniformly good uniformly tasteless, so will our speech become one speech. I who love words and the endless possibility of words am saddened by this inevitability, for with local accent will disappear local tempo. The idioms, the figures of speech that make language rich and full of poetry of place and time must go, and in their place will be a national speech, wrapped and packaged, standard and tasteless. Localness is not gone, but it is going. In the many years since I have listened to the land, the change is very great. Traveling west along the northern routes, I did not hear a truly local speech until I reached Montana. That is one of the reasons why I fell in love again with Montana. The west coast went back to packaged English. The southwest kept a grasp, but a slipping grasp, on localness. 
Of course, the Deep South holds on by main strength to its regional expressions, just as it holds on and treasures some other anachrisms, but no region can hold out for long against the highway, the high-tension line, and the national television. What I am mourning is perhaps not worth saving, but I regret its loss nevertheless. Even while I protest the assembly line production of our food, our songs, our language, and eventually our souls, I know that it was a rare home that baked good bread in the old days. Mother's cooking was with rare exceptions poor, and good unpasteurized milk touched only by the flies and bits of manure filled with bacteria. The healthy old time life was ruled with aches, sudden death from unknown causes, and that sweet local speech. I mourn, was the child of illiteracy and ignorance. It is the nature of a man as he grows older, a small bridge in time, to protest against change, particularly change for the better. But it is true that we have exchanged corpulence for starvation, and either one will kill us. The lines of change are down. We, or at least I, can have no conception of human life and human thought in a hundred or fifty years. Perhaps my greatest wisdom is the knowledge that I do not know. The sad ones are those who waste their energy in trying to hold it back, for they can only feel bitterness and loss and no joy and gain. As I pass through or near the great hives of production, Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, Toledo, Pontiac, Flint, and later the South Bend and Gary, my eyes and mind were battered by the fantastic hugeness and energy of production, a complication that resembles chaos and cannot be. So might one look down on an ant hill and see no method or direction or purpose in the darting, hurrying inhabitants. What was so wonderful was that I could come again to a quiet country road, tree bordered with fenced fields and cows, and pull up Rosinante beside a lake of clear, clean water, and see high overhead the arrows of southing ducks and geese. There Charlie could, with his delicate exploring nose, read his own particular literature on bushes and tree trunks and leave his message there perhaps as important in endless time as these pen scratches i put down on perishable paper there in the quiet with the wind flicking tree branches and distorting the water's mirror i cooked improbable dinners in my disposable aluminum pans made coffee so rich and sturdy it would float a nail and sitting on my own back doorsteps could finally come to think about what i had seen and try to arrange some pattern of thought to accommodate the teeming crowds of my seeing and hearing. I'll tell you what it was like. Go to the Uffizi in Florence, the Louvre in Paris, and you are so crushed with the numbers, once the might of greatness, that you go away distressed, with a feeling like constipation. And then when you are alone, remembering, the canvases sort themselves out. Some are eliminated by your taste or limitations, but others stand clear and clean. Then you go back to look at one thing untroubled by the shouts of the multitude. After confusion, I can go to the Prado in Madrid and pass unseeing the thousands of pictures shouting for my attention, and I can visit a friend. Not a large Greco, San Pablo con un libro. St. Paul has just closed his book. His finger marks the last page read, and on his face are the wonder and will to understand after the book is closed. Maybe understanding is possible only after. Years ago, when I used to work in the woods, it was said of lumbermen, they did their logging in the whorehouse and their sex in the woods. So I have to find my way through the exploding production lines of the Middle West while sitting alone beside a lake in northern Michigan. As I sat secure in the silence, a jeep scuffed to a stop on the road and good Charlie left his work and roared. A young man in boots, corduroys, and a red and black checkered mackinaw climbed out and strode near. He spoke in the harsh, unfriendly tone a man uses when he doesn't like much what he has to do. Don't you know this land is posted? This is private property. Normally his tone would have sparked a tinder in me. I would have flared an ugliness of anger, and he would have been able to evict me with pleasure and good conscience. We might have even have edged into a quarrel with passion and violence. That would be only normal, except that the beauty in this and the quiet made me slow to respond with resentment, and in my hesitation, I lost it. I said, I knew it must be private. I was about to look for someone to ask permission, or maybe to pay to rest here. The owner don't want campers. They leave papers around and build fires. 
I don't blame him. I know the mess they make. See that sign on that tree? No trespassing, hunting, fishing, camping. Well, I said, that sounds as if it means business. If it's your job to throw me off, you've got to throw me off. I'll go peacefully, but I've just made a pot of coffee. Do you think your boss would mind if I finish it? Would he mind if I offered you a cup? Then you could kick me off quicker. The young man grinned. What the hell, he said. You don't build no fires, and you don't throw out no trash. I'm doing worse than that. I'm trying to bribe you with a cup of coffee. It's worse than that, too. I'm suggesting a dollop of old granddad in the coffee. He laughed then. What the hell, he said. Let me get my Jeep off the road. Well, the whole pattern was broken. He squatted cross-legged in the pine needles on the ground and sipped his coffee. Charlie sniffed close and let himself be touched, and that's a rare thing for Charlie. He does not permit strangers to touch him, just happens to be somewhere else. But this young man's fingers found a place behind the ears Charlie delights to have rubbed, and he sighed contentedly and sat down. What you doing? Going hunting? I see guns in your truck. Just driving through. You know how you see a place and it's just right and you're just tired enough? I guess you can't help stopping. Yeah, he said. I know what you mean. You got a nice outfit. I like it, and Charlie likes it. Charlie? Never heard of a dog named Charlie. Hello, Charlie. Wouldn't want to get in trouble with your boss. Think I have to drag ass now? What the hell, he said. He ain't here. I'm in charge. You ain't doing no harm. I'm trespassing. Know something? Fella camped here. Kind of a nut. So I came to kick him off. He said something funny. He says, trespassing ain't a crime and it ain't a misdemeanor. He says it's a tort. Now, what the hell does that mean? He was kind of a nut. Search me, I said. I'm not a nut. Let me warm up your coffee. I warmed it two ways. You make swell coffee, said my host. Before it gets too dark, I've got to find a place to park. Know any place up the road where they'll let me stay the night? If you pull over that way behind those pine trees, nobody could see you from the road. But I'd be committing a tort. Yeah, I wish to Christ I knew what that meant. He drove ahead of me in the jeep and helped me find a level place in the pine grove. And after dark, he came into Rosinante and admired her facilities, and we drank some whiskey together and had a nice visit and told each other a few lies. I showed him some fancy jigs and poppers I'd bought at Abercrombie and Fitch and gave him one. And I gave him some paperback thrillers I'd finished with, all loaded with sex and sadism, and also a copy of Field and Stream. In return, he invited me to stay as long as I wished and said he'd come by tomorrow and we'd do a little fishing, and I accepted for one day at least. It's nice to have friends, and besides, I wanted a little time to think about the things I'd seen, the huge factories and plants, and the scurry and production. The guardian of the lake was a lonely man, the more so because he had a wife. He showed me her picture in a plastic shield in his wallet, a prettyish blonde girl trying her best to live up to the pictures of magazines, a girl of products, home permanents, shampoos, rinses, skin conditioners. She hated being out in what she called the sticks, longed for the great and gracious life in Toledo or South Bend. Her only company was found in the shiny pages of charm and glamour. Eventually, she would sulk her way to success. Her husband would get a job in some great, clinging organism of progress, and they would live happily ever after. All this came through in small, oblique spurts in his conversation. She knew exactly what she wanted, and he didn't, but his want would ache in him all his life. After he drove away in his jeep, I lived his life for him, and it put a mist of despair on me. He wanted a pretty little wife, and he wanted something else, and he couldn't have both. Charlie had a dream so violent that he awakened me. His legs jerked in the motions of running, and he made little yipping cries. Perhaps he dreamed he chased some gigantic rabbit and couldn't quite catch it. Or maybe in his dream, something chased him. On the second supposition, I put out a hand and awakened him, but the dream must have been strong. He muttered to himself and complained and drank half a bowl of water before he went back to sleep. The guardian came back soon after sunup. He brought a rod and I got out my own and rigged a spinning wheel and had to find my glasses to tie on the bright painted popper. The monofilament line is transparent, is said to be invisible to fish, and is completely invisible to me without my glasses. I said, you know, I don't have a fishing license. What the hell, he said. We probably won't catch anything anyway. And he was right, we didn't. 
We walked and cast and walked and did everything we knew to interest Bass or Pike. My friend kept saying, they're right down there if we can just get the message through, but we never did. If they were down there, they still are. A remarkable amount of my fishing is like that, but I like it just the same. My wants are simple. I have no desire to latch on to a monster symbol of fate and prove my manhood in Titanic for seeing war. But sometimes I do like a couple of cooperative fish of frying size. At noon, I refused an invitation to come to dinner and meet the wife. I was growing increasingly anxious to meet my own wife, so I hurried on. There was a time not too long ago when a man put out to sea and ceased to exist for two or three years or forever. And when the covered wagons set out to cross the continent, friends and relations remaining at home might never hear from the wanderers again. Life went on. Problems were settled. Decisions were taken. Even I can remember when a telegram meant just one thing, a death in the family. In one short lifetime, the telephone had changed all of that. If in this wandering narrative, I seem to have cut the cords of family joys and sorrows, of Junior's current delinquency and Junior Junior's new tooth, of business triumph and agony, it is not so. Three times a week from some bar, supermarket, or tire and tool clutter service station, I put calls through to New York and reestablished my identity in time and space. For three or four minutes, I had a name, and the duties and joys and frustrations a man carries with him like a comet's tail. It was like dodging back and forth from one dimension to another, a silent explosion of breaking through a sound barrier, a curious experience, like a quick drip into a known but alien water. It was established that my wife was to fly out to meet me in Chicago for a short break in my journey. In two hours, in theory at least, she would slice through the segment of the earth that had taken me weeks to clamber over. I had become impatient, stuck to the huge toll roads that strings the northern border of Indiana, bypassed Elkhart and South Bend and Gary. The nature of the road describes the nature of the travel. The straightness of the way, the swish of traffic, the unbroken speed are hypnotic, and while the miles peel off, an imperceptible exhaustion sets in. Day and night are one. The setting sun is neither an invitation nor a command to stop, for the traffic rolls constantly. Late in the night, I pulled into a rest area, had a hamburger at the great lunch counter that never closes, and walked to Charlie on the close-clipped grass. I slept an hour, but awakened long before daylight. I had brought city seats and shirts and shoes, but had forgotten to bring a suitcase to transport them from truck to hotel room. Indeed, I don't know where I could have stored a suitcase. In a garbage can under an arc light, I found a clean, corrugated paper carton and packed my city clothes. I wrapped my clean white shirts in road maps and tied the carton with fishing line. Knowing my tendency to panic in the roar and crush of traffic, I started into Chicago long before daylight. I wanted to end up at the Ambassador East, where I had reservations, and true to form, ended up lost. Finally, in a burst of invention, I hired an all-night taxi to leave me, and sure enough, I had passed very near my hotel. If the doorman and Bohas found my means of travel unusual, they gave no sign. I handed out my suits on hangers, my shoes in the same pocket of a hunting coat, and my shirts in their neat wrapping of New England road maps. Rosinante was whisked away to a garage for storage. Charlie had to go to a kennel to be stored, bathed, and hollanderized. Even at his age, he's a vain dog and loves to be beautified. But when he found out he was to be left and in Chicago, his, nor- his ordinary aplomb broke down and he cried out in rage and despair. I closed my ears and went away quickly to my hotel. I think I am well and favorably known at the Ambassador East, but this need not apply when I arrived in wrinkled hunting clothes, unshaven, and lightly crusted with the dirt of travel and bleary-eyed from driving most of the night. Certainly I had a reservation, but my room not be vacated until noon. The hotel's position was explained to me carefully. I understood it and forgave the management. My own position was that I would like a bath and a bed, but since that was impossible, I would simply pile up in a chair in the lobby and go to sleep until my room was ready. I saw in the desk man's eyes his sense of uneasiness. Even I knew I would be no ornament to this elegant and expensive pleasure dome. He signaled an assistant manager, perhaps by telepathy, and all together we worked out a solution. A gentleman had just checked out to catch an early airplane. 
His room was not clean and prepared, but I was welcome to use it until mine was ready. Thus the problem was solved by intelligence and patience, and each got what he wanted. I had my chance at a hot bath and sleep, and the hotel was spared the mischance of having me in the lobby. The room had not been touched since its former occupant had left. I sank into a comfortable chair to pull off my boots and even got one of them off before I began to notice things and then more things and more. In a surprisingly short time, I forgot the bath and the sleep and found myself deeply involved with Lonesome Henry. An animal resting or passing by leaves, crushed grass, footprints, and perhaps droppings, but a human occupying a room for one night prints his character, his biography, his recent history, and sometimes his future plans and hopes. I further believe that personality seeps into walls and is slowly released. This might well be an explanation of ghosts and such manifestations. Although my conclusions may be wrong, I seem to be sensitive to the spore of the human. Also, I am not shy about admitting that I am an incongruable peeping Tom. I have never passed an unshaded window without looking in. I have never closed my ears to a conversation that was none of my business. I can justify or even dignify this by protesting that in my trade I must know about people, but I suspect that I am simply curious. As I sat in this unmade room, Lonesome Harry began to take shape and dimension. I could feel that the recently departed guest in the bits and pieces of himself he had left behind. Of course, Charlie, even with his imperfect nose, would have known more. But Charlie was in a kennel preparing to be cooked. Even so, Harry is as real to me as anyone I've ever met, and more real than many. He's not unique, in fact, is a member of a fairly large group. Therefore, he becomes of interest in any investigation of America. Before I began to patch him together, Lest a number of men grow nervous, let me declare that his name is not Harry. He lives in Westport, Connecticut. This information comes from the laundry shows from several shirts. A man usually lives where he has his shirts laundered. I only suspect that he commutes to work in his in New York. I only suspect that he commutes to work in New York. His trip to Chicago was primarily a business trip with some traditional pleasures thrown in. I know his name because he signed it in a number of times on hotel stationery each signature with a slightly different slant. This seems to indicate that he is not entirely sure of himself in the business world, but there were other signs of that. He had started a letter to his wife, which also ended in the wastebasket. Darling, everything is going okay. Tried to call your aunt, but no answer. I wish you were here with me. This is a lonesome town. You forgot to put in my cufflinks. I bought a cheap pair at Marshall Field. I'm writing this while I wait for C.E. to call. Hope he brings the cunt. It was just as well that Darling didn't drop in to make Chicago less lonesome for Harry. His guest was not C.E. with a contract. She was a brunette and wore a very pale lipstick, cigarette butts in the ashtray and the edge of a highball glass. They drank Jack Daniels, a whole bottle, the empty bottle, six soda bottles, and a tub that held ice cubes. She used a heavy perfume and did not stay the night. The second pillow used but not slept on. Also, no lipstick on discarded tissues. I like to think her name was Lucille. I don't know why. Maybe because it was and is. She was a nervous friend, smoked Harry's recessed, filtered cigarettes, but stubbed each one out, only one third smoked, and lighted another. She didn't want to put them out. She crushed the frayed ends. Lucille wore one of those little smidgens of hats held on by turned combs. One of the combs broke loose. That and a bobby pin beside the bed told me Lucille was a brunette. I don't know whether or not Lucille is professional, but at least she was practiced. There is a fine business-like quality about her. She didn't leave too many things around, as an amateur might. She also didn't get drunk. Her glass was empty, but the vase of red roses, courtesy of management, smelled of Jack Daniels, and it didn't do them any good. I wonder what Harry and Lucille talked about. I wonder whether she made him less lonesome. Somehow I doubt it. I think both of them were doing what was expected of them. Harry shouldn't have slugged his drinks. His stomach isn't up to it. Tom's wrapper is in the wastebasket. I guess his business is a sensitive one and hard on the stomach. Lonesome Harry must have finished the bottle after Lucille left. He had a hangover. Two full tubes of bromo seltzer in the bathroom. Three things haunted me about Lonesome Harry. First, I don't think he had any fun. Second, I think he was really lonesome maybe in chronic state. And third, he didn't do a single thing that couldn't be predicted. Didn't break a glass or mirror, committed no outrages, 
left no physical evidence of joy. I had been hobbling around with one boot off, finding out about Harry. I even looked under the bed and in the closet. He hadn't even forgotten a tie. I felt sad about Harry. That was part four of seven of Travels with Charlie by John Steinbeck. Going by the book, that was actually part four. But since parts two and three are so big, I have split them up into multiple parts. So next we will be doing book part three, but our part five. And hopefully that will be coming to you a bit sooner than this one. I hope you guys enjoyed that. And again, thank you for all your support and listening and giving me feedback. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.